Good evening aspirants meeting you all after a long time welcome to the hindi news analysis brought to you by shankarais academy today i'll be covering the hindi news edition dated 22nd august 2022 i have taken these news articles for discussion today along with that we also have a practice prelims question session listen to today's analysis because along with this video i'll be posting a poll question also and that poll question will be based on today's topics only So let us start our analysis now. Let us take up this article. It says that the executive chairman of NALSA has formally launched the Legal Aid Defense Council system. What does NALSA stands for? National Legal Services Authority. Okay. But in today's discussion, we are going to see about this system only: Legal Aid Defense Council system. In short, LADCS. See, it is a known fact that all the accused persons cannot afford the legal services. They may not have that much money. to appoint a lawyer of their own and for this reason only the legal services authorities was established the legal services authority provides legal services to the accused individuals or even to the convicts but the only condition here is they should satisfy the eligibility criteria which is given in section 12 of the legal services authorities act of 1987 here i have given the section 12 just go through it So now how this legal services authorities is providing legal services we have never seen this aspect see at present the authority is providing legal services through assigned counsel system of delivery of legal aid now under this system cases are assigned to panel lawyers by the legal services institutions and that is why it is given this name because the panel lawyers are assigned but who are panel lawyers these are the lawyers who are selected under regulation 8 of uh, National Legal Services Authority Regulation of 2010 these panel lawyers render free and competent legal services to the deserving and needy persons under the legal services scheme so actually every court whether it is supreme court or the high courts or the district courts they have a panel of lawyers they are the panel lawyers these panel lawyers they do various functions which are appointed to them by the courts Okay now these panel lawyers are assigned uh, to legal aid then they will be taking up the legal aid cases but there is a major drawback in this system here the panel lawyers to whom cases are assigned no they also have private practices so they cannot exclusively devote their time to the legal aid cases along with this the accessibility and availability of these panel lawyers also remains an issue in the system why i am calling this as an issue because if they cannot be accessible and if they are not available then it will restrict the timely client consultation and it will also hinder the update about the progress of the cases to the legal aid seekers that is why the need for legal aid defense counsel system comes it mainly comes from the fact that court based legal services are needed to be strengthened for providing effective and efficient legal services to the we current marginalized sections of the society so as a measure to improve the process only now a legal aid delivery based model is launched it is this new system ladcs now this system is used for providing legal aid in criminal matters and the most important point here is that it is based on the public defender system for delivery of legal aid see i said that as per the current system assigned counsel system is followed and in this assigned counsel system panel lawyers are assigned by the authorities and these panel lawyers also handle private cases but now in the public defender system which is used under the legal aid defense counsel system it involves lawyers who do not handle private cases so who are appointed here in the system it involves salaried lawyers with assistance and these lawyers will exclusively handle the legal aid work in criminal matters and because of this there are many advantages associated with this new system over the previous system first one is the availability and accessibility of the legal aid defense counsel so this will lead to timely and effective client consultations second it will also lead to effective monitoring of legal aid cases 
then professional management of legal aid work in criminal matters will also be done there will also be enhanced responsiveness and this will lead to proper update of legal aid seekers about the progress of their case it will also ensure the accountability on the part of the legal aid providers okay these are some of the advantages associated with this system but know that as of now it is only implemented on pilot basis in few districts for providing legal aid in criminal matters in the sessions court okay and if it is successful it will be implemented in all the courts so point to remember is the legal aid defense counsel system is based on public defender system it provides legal aid in criminal matters and salaried lawyers will be appointed for this purpose okay with these points in mind now let us get to the next discussion the discussion is going to be based on this text and context article which is about an important technology that is often making news here the article is about facial recognition technology in short frt but why suddenly this uh, frt is in news it is because of a rta reply obtained by an organization called internet freedom foundation see this foundation asked about the use of frt technology by delhi police how delhi police is using this it is because of a 2018 case law sadan haldar versus national capital territory of delhi in this case law the delhi high court directed the delhi police to obtain this technology to trace and identify missing children but the rta reply has revealed that delhi police has not limited the use of this technology to trace the missing children rather they have been using it for other purposes also mainly it was found to be used to monitor anti caa protests in 2019 it was also used by delhi police during 2020 northeast uh, delhi riots and even in the 2021 red fort violence and even the 2022 recent jahangirpuri riots but remember it was allowed by the delhi court only for the purpose of tracing and identifying missing children so citing such misuse by delhi police this text and context article highlights the issues with the use of this technology and since mains is also nearby let us have a comprehensive understanding of this technology we'll know whether there are any types in this technology we'll see why it is needed and finally we'll see the issues associated with it as discussed in the news article so this is the syllabus that can be linked with this discussion first let us start by understanding the technology behind this so if you look at the name itself facial recognition technology you can simply say that it is a technology that recognizes faces she so keep this in mind that in mains if there is any question on topics which you don't know try to write at least something based on the title itself or the name itself do not leave any question unattended so this frt technology recognizes faces using a technology it actually uses computer algorithms to create a digital map of your face now this digital map is compared with all the data which it has to arrive at a match now basically this technology involves four steps in the first step an input device is used to capture and scan the face here the input device is most often a camera so it will capture your face and will scan it so in the second step the important features of the face are focused like you know uh, whether it is a round face or a square face whether you have a long nose or a small nose or big eyes or small eyes like these all these features are extracted and by this a digital map of the face is generated you can see in this image how this digital map is being generated here digital map is nothing but a virtual image so now the face is ready here comes the third step now this digital image is compared with all the digital images at hand or the images which are in the database to find a match here is where the comparison starts so in the final step as per the protocol a specific match is identified so this is how a facial recognition system works first capturing and scanning then extracting facial data then comparing database and then matching and identifying but in this process there are two types and based on this we can uh, even uh, differentiate the technology the first type is the one is to one verification now in this type the facial map of a person is obtained to authenticate the identity for example many of you will be using uh, your face to unlock the phone right here the front camera uses one is to one verification only here one is to one means your phone already has your photograph now that photograph will be matched with the image captured by the camera so there is one is to one verification only your face is directly matched there on the other hand there is the second type which is one is to n verification 
that is here the facial map of a person is obtained to match with the database when we say database there are many faces to match you would have seen this type of verification in a crime series okay where uh, they have a suspected criminal and they will be matching the face of that suspect with their database of criminals so this is one is to n verification one image is compared with many images to find a match okay so this is the basics that you need to know about facial recognition technology actually in the beginning we saw about the delhi example right it was also using the one is to n verification only now why do we need such a technology this is because there are certain advantages with it the first advantage is improved public safety so this technology can be used by the law enforcement agency to speed up the investigation process some countries are even working on developing uh, this technology and artificial intelligence that will monitor people's behavior and study the behavioral pattern now by studying the behavioral pattern the system will alert the law enforcement officials before the crime is even committed so basically frt can be used as a predictive technology to bring down the crime rate it can predict in advance that is why we are calling this as a predictive technology for example you look at this image here the faces of many people are being mapped and then it is immediately being compared so if the person is identified as the correct person who should be in that place then that person will be allowed if not so then that person will be taken to the police for example if a terrorist is walking through an airport then through this technology the terrorist can be easily identified by the law enforcement officials so first is improved public safety second is convenience this frt is easy to integrate into our present day system and also it helps to smooth in the operations here again take the example of airports generally in airports we face three hassles first we have to get the boarding pass and then there is security check and there is final verification of boarding pass before boarding the flight now here note that in the first stage that is while getting the boarding pass only your credentials will be verified like your name your aadhar number other details and all will be verified in this stage but in the security check and while boarding the flight what they will check is whether you have a boarding pass or not or whether you are carrying any other unwanted items with you so how frt will be helpful here so except for the security check the other two stages can be simplified using facial recognition technology just by scanning our face our credentials can be verified when we enter the airport and this will reduce the waiting time at the airport and it will also enhance our overall experience another major advantage is it helps in simplifying obtaining of government services when the facial recognition technology is fully integrated in the government system then people will not find the need to carry a physical identity card for example if you want to avail a government service like pds public distribution system then there won't be a need to produce aadhar card or ration card instead all the necessary information can be obtained by scanning your face itself how cool that would be other than that it could be used in other services like identifying missing children then identify victims of human trafficking so here there is a great potential because we'll never know a person who is passing us or a child who is playing is a missing child or not or that person is a trafficked human being or not but if this technology is available then with the photographs obtained from the family we can easily identify that person wherever they are in the globe so this technology has huge potential in this area other than that its usage in healthcare and other sectors are also being explored okay so these are the main advantages associated with facial recognition technology but like any other technology even this facial recognition technology has certain issues one of the major issues is inaccuracy this inaccuracy can result in false positives or false negatives and therefore it can result in misidentification of a person so for example the news article mentions an uh, instance where amazon's facial recognition technology incorrectly identified members of us congress see this uh, amazon's uh, technology is known as recognition it identified the members of us legislature as people who have been arrested for a crime here i have given an example for you from the internet you can see that here is the person you want to identify and you can see how it is being matched with several other persons also we'll never know whether all these persons are the same persons or they are different ones so what will happen if this is used by a law enforcement agency anyone can be misidentified so when there is inaccuracy the frt will create lots of problems 
it not only has you know problems with the law enforcement agencies even it will have problems while delivering public services because such false negatives might prevent the people from accessing public service or even the wrong person may get the service all these are possible with this technology if there is inaccuracy now the next issue is linked to this inaccuracy it is the bias you have to remember that after all facial recognition technology are a bunch of computer programs which are written by humans only so in some cases human biases and prejudices are directly or indirectly embedded in the technology now i already said that effort is inaccurate this was even found by research studies that uh, the inaccuracy of FRT increases with people's color and gender take a look at this graph here this graph shows the accuracy of various facial recognition technologies if you carefully look at the graph you can find that the accuracy is low for dark females across all technologies this is a major issue because if FRT is integrated with law enforcement then it might result in false prosecution of women and false prosecution of people of color particularly if the woman is of color then you can understand the level of inaccuracy there so that is why first inaccuracy need to be corrected and then the bias should be removed other than this there is also the issue of mass surveillance see mass surveillance is nothing but an indiscriminate surveillance it uses systems or technologies that collect analyze and generate data on indefinite or large numbers of people here instead of limiting the surveillance to individuals on whom there is reasonable suspicion the surveillance is kept on all see if i am a convicted criminal of a particular offense then the government can have a surveillance on me for that crime or a crime related to that but if i am a good citizen who doesn't have a prior criminal record then why the government need to observe my activities this is wrong right that is why we say mass surveillance leads to indiscriminate monitoring it affects people's privacy and it also affects all the rights related to privacy like freedom to express yourself and even the freedom to protest in the delhi police example itself i said that during many riots and protests the fdi technology was used by the police without the permission of the courts so like this mass surveillance is a major issue and it leads to a totalitarian government so one of the basic tenets of our justice system is you are innocent until proven guilty but this technology takes it a step backwards because it accuses a person even before committing a crime using predictive technology predicting someone that they might do a crime is also a discrimination but remember this will not apply to a criminal who has been convicted for the same crime again and again so now this mass surveillance if it is coupled with inherent inaccuracy then the frt might result in many false positives so people who have no intention of even committing a crime might be persecuted we have to understand this so mass surveillance is always an issue assume that i am buying ropes and knives from different stores that does not mean that i am going to kill someone or kidnap someone i might use the rope for hanging my clothes and knife for cutting vegetables but on the other hand if i am a criminal who has used these ropes and knives to commit a crime before then at that time the law enforcement agencies can predict that i am planning another crime so you can understand where such things should be used and where it should not be used individuals privacy should not be disturbed now because of this privacy issue there is also the issue of data privacy and lack of informed consent see at present we do not have a data protection law even the data protection bill was recently withdrawn by the government and we also lack specific regulation related to facial recognition technology so there is nothing to protect us against the misuse of this technology so due to this lack of protection officials can use the data collected according to their whims and fancies this lack of proper legal protection has resulted in function creep see a function creep happens when someone uses information for a purpose that is not the original specified purpose the best example is the delhi police example as i said the high court allowed to use frt only to identify missing children but what happened was they were using it for other purposes also so this is a clear case of function creep now this also leads to violation of data privacy because there is lack of informed consent and finally we have the issue of data breach see this facial recognition technology saves a facial features it is a sensitive information so now government is having access to such sensitive information but we do not have a data protection law 
So if there is a data breach and if anti-social elements get access to such sensitive information, then it can be misused easily. Then there will be total chaos, like what happened with the Aadhaar issue. The Aadhaar details were released, but the government told that it is being protected. So the same can happen with FRT also. So these are some of the major issues associated with FRT. So you may ask whether it is used as of now, since it is uh, having these many issues. So it is not widely used in our country as of now, but in other countries it is used. Take the example of China. It has been using FRT for all the wrong reasons. The Chinese government has been gathering large amounts of data for its mass surveillance programs. Here their goal is, through this surveillance, the Chinese government aims to maximize what the government can find out about a person's identity, their activities and social connections. And through these informations, they are trying to know how it will help them to maintain their authoritarian rule. So, the use of FRT by Chinese government is a classic case of technology misuse. So, what is the need of the R? First, we need a proper data protection law. And then, there should be proper R&D, research and development. The export should go through international best practices and based on that, clear guidelines must be drafted. And these guidelines should be separate for the government and for the corporations. Because government will have a wide use. Even the law enforcement agencies will be using it. So the guidelines should be separate for the government and the corporations. First, we need these two. And then only if there is a misuse, it can be tackled easily. See, when there is a technology, it is obvious it will be misused in some way. But what is needed is a grievance redressal mechanism. There should be some way to punish that misuse and to stop it. And for this only, we need the proper laws and guidelines. So I hope you understood uh, about the facial recognition technology, why there is a need for it in the current world. And then we also saw what issues are there in it and how they should be solved. And while discussing all these, we also saw a new term called as function creep. So with these points, you can write a well-constructed mains answer. And if there is a question which asks you to take a stand on whether we need such a technology in this world, you can give your opinion depending on the positives and negatives with this technology. Okay, so now let's move on to the next discussion. Now, this news article here, it says that Reserve Bank of India has floated a discussion paper about imposing charges in payment systems such as UPI, NEFT and IMPS. But the finance ministry has replied to this move. It has said that UPI, that is Unified Payments Interface, is a digital public good and it has immense convenience for the public and it provides productivity gains for the economy. So the finance ministry has said that there is no consideration in the government to levy any charges for UPI services. Okay, so from this article, what we have to focus is the term public good. Taking this opportunity, we are going to see one of the basic topics of economics, that is public goods and private goods. Let me start with public goods. See, these are the commodities or services which are provided by the nature or the government of a country. It is either provided free of cost or it is provided by taxing few people to offer mass benefit to the public in general. Now, the major significance of this public good is these commodities develop the infrastructure and living standard of a country. Now, some of the public goods and services you can easily list out. It includes police service, fire brigade, national defense services, public transports, roads, dams, rivers. All these are public goods and services. And now, in today's news article, the government has said that UPA services is also public good. But can they simply say this? Can the government simply announce UPI is a public good? See, actually, to be classified as a public good, certain characteristics should be present in that good. These characteristics include being non-rival, non-excludable, non-rejectable and free-riding. See here, non-rival is in the sense that the public goods are non-competitive. That is, it can serve many people at the same time. It won't hinder the opportunity of another person who is using it. For example, the roads and bridges are non-rival and hence they are public goods because it can be used by all the people. Now, the public goods should be non-excludable. This means these goods are free of cost and they can be used by anyone without any restriction. Here also, you can use the examples of roads and bridges. 
because it can be used by anyone free of cost now the public goods are also non rejectable this means the use of public goods cannot be dismissed it is because it is available collectively to all the people see if we take the example of roads and bridges again here people cannot say that they won't use this road and they cannot say that we need another road they can ask for a road constructed with better material but they simply cannot ask for another road why because it is collectively available to all so they do not have the right to choose now final characteristic is the free riding nature so it means that the good which is characterized under public goods benefit even those who have not paid for it see such people who are not paying for it are termed as free riders this is because we saw that the public goods are also made available using the tax payers money so all others who do not pay tax are also using these public goods without contributing to it so this is the free riding nature so through these characteristics of being non rival non excludable non rejectable free riding the public goods are non competitive free of cost accessible to all and beneficial to all okay now let us come to private goods private goods are the products or services which are manufactured or produced by the companies and these are the companies which are owned by entrepreneurs who aim at earning profits so they trade such goods in free market now one of the main objectives of private goods is to meet customers requirement so only when they produce products which meet the customers requirement they will be able to earn profits okay you can understand the relation here if the customers requirement are met then only they will buy the products so from this you can understand that private goods are the personal needs of customers so examples for this include clothes cosmetics footwear cars electronic products even food is a private good but like the public goods even to be classified as a private good there should be certain characteristics but these characteristics are exact opposite of public goods what are they private goods are rival they are excludable rejectable and it constrains free riding also so here rival in the sense that these private products involve rivalry or competition among the consumers for its use this is because the consumption by one person will restrict its use by another person let me take an example to make you understand assume that i bought a tv whose model is x now that particular tv cannot be used by you right you can buy another tv of that same model x but you cannot use the tv which is bought by me because it is not a public good it is a private good because in a public goods it can be used by n number of people like the roads now the private goods are also excludable it means that they involve cost and therefore the non payers are excluded from the consumption of that good actually the free riding constraint is a subset of this characteristic we saw that free riding means persons who do not pay for the service can also use the service but in private good i am saying non payers are excluded from consumption and that is why free riding is not possible in private goods now the final characteristic of a private good is it is rejectable this means that private good can be unaccepted or it can be rejected by consumers why they can reject because they have multiple alternatives and they have the right to select the product according to their preference for example today i might like sony tv but tomorrow i might like a better tv model with new technology so according to my preference i will choose the good because it is a private good okay so in this discussion we saw what is a private good and a public good we saw the characteristics so now depending on these characteristics why don't you decide and tell me whether upi that is unified payments interface is a public good or a private good you can also listen to our analysis on june 17th where we have discussed about upi its features its benefits etc after listening to that analysis you can decide whether it is a public good or a private good don't forget to share your opinion in the comment section now let us move on to the next discussion let us take up this article now it states that tribal communities in tamil nadu are facing difficulties in receiving what is rightfully theirs so we know that forest rights act has granted various rights to the tribal communities but according to the news article due to the lack of improper implementation of the act the tribal communities are not able to enjoy their rights so in this discussion we are going to see the rights granted to the tribal communities who are the traditional forest dwellers we'll be discussing their rights as per the forest rights act of 2006 first of all let us see who are entitled to benefits under this act two categories 
of forest dwellers are entitled one is the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and the other is the other traditional forest dwellers both of them enjoy benefits under the act see here forest dwelling scheduled tribes includes the members or community of the scheduled tribes who primarily reside in the forest or who depend on the forest or forest lands for their livelihood needs then what about other traditional forest dwellers see it includes any member or community who has resided in or who depends on the forest or forest land for their livelihood needs but the additional condition here is they should have resided for at least 3 generations prior to the 13th day of december 2005 that's before the act came into force but for the purpose of this discussion i'm going to call the forest dwelling scheduled tribes together with the other traditional forest dwellers as simply traditional forest dwellers okay now let us see the rights provided under the act first is the title rights see this refers to the right of ownership this right is provided by section 3 subsection 1 clause a it is read with the section 4 subsection 6 of the act these sections give the traditional forest dwellers the right to ownership to land in which they perform farming activities now the maximum limit for uh, such title rights is 4 hectares there is also another condition here the ownership is given only to the lands that were actually cultivated no new lands will be granted this right now as per the news article the tribals in tamil nadu are given title rights to an artificial limit of 1.5 cents but just now i said that the maximum limit set by the act is 4 hectares so that is why the tribals in tamil nadu they are saying the act is not implemented properly in the state so first was the title rights now second is the use rights here the traditional forest dwellers are allowed to extract minor forest produce the section 3 subsection 1 clause c of the act grants right to extract over 40 minor forest products in addition to this they are also allowed grazing rights here also the news article says that the tribals in tamil nadu are not given proper access to minor forest produce like gooseberries so if you want to know more about uh, minor forest produce just few days before we have covered this topic it was covered on 17th august i will give the link to this discussion in the comment section and also in the description box as friends who want to know more about this topic can view that analysis okay now let us come to the next right it is the relief and development rights now as per this right if the forest dwellers are evicted from their land to ensure forest protection then they have the right to safe rehabilitation now the last one we are going to discuss is the forest management rights this is granted under section 5 of the act now under this section the forest dwellers have the right to conserve and manage forest areas using their traditional techniques so they not only have the right to use the products from the forest they also have the right to conserve it okay so these are the major rights offered to the forest dwellers by the forest rights act of 2006 So with these points in mind now let us move on to the next discussion. So now let us move on to the last discussion for today which is based on this news article it is about the demolition of a building in Chennai. See the article mentions that a group of people stopped the demolition by citing the importance of art deco architecture in Chennai. So why I chose this topic it is because this art deco architecture is important. See often we talk about different activities or actions or resolutions that were taken by indians against the colonial rule but we have never seen this architectural angle that is why today this topic is important see so this art deco architecture was adopted in chennai as a protest against the british rule so in today's discussion let us see few facts about the colonial architecture and also about this art deco architecture when coming to india the british brought a wealth of architectural styles with them and this is visible in the constructions which they undertook in their rule and that is why today in india we could find many british influenced styles and structures mainly the britishers brought with them the gothic style of architecture so the main features of this style are pointed arches stained glass windows flying buttress etc flying buttress is nothing but this slanting column you can see in these images so these were the main features of gothic style and in this style red sandstone and coarse limestones were primarily used for construction 
Now, this style merged with the Indian architecture and it resulted in the Indo-Gothic style of architecture. This style is also known as Victorian style of architecture. See, you should understand that here this name Victorian style does not refer to a particular style. Rather, it refers to the era during which this style was prominent. It was during Queen Victoria's rule over United Kingdom. So, some of the famous examples of Indo-Gothic architecture in India include certain important structures in Kolkata like this St. John's Church, Fort William, Calcutta Cathedral. Along with this, even the Mutiny Memorial Church in Kanpur is also an example of Indo-Gothic architecture. You can see the images of these uh, structures which I just said and you can see the similarities, right? But it is said that after a certain period, especially in the 20th century, particularly post-1911, the constructions undertaken by the British Raj were based on Neo-Roman style. It is also known as Neo-Classical style. This style was a confluence of all styles of architecture. There was also a focus on circular buildings in this style. And in this style, the oriental motifs are overused. So, oriental motifs are nothing but these different uh, patterns and designs. Now, some of the best examples of uh, this style of architecture in India is the Supreme Court of India and even the Rashtrapati Bhavan. But then there was a shift from these styles to the Art Deco style of architecture in India. Actually, you should know that Art Deco emerged as the counteraction to a highly stylized movement. It is called as the Art Nouveau movement. See, this Art Nouveau is also a style that came after the neoclassical style. This Art Nouveau is an ornamental style of art which flourished between 1890s and 1910s throughout Europe and United States. So, it was prominent in Europe and also in UK. So, as a protest against the Britishers, it is said that the Swadeshi business leaders, they started the construction of Art Deco style buildings because they do not want what was famous in United Kingdom and what was being promoted by the Britishers. So, this Art Deco it started out in Paris around 1920s. It expanded globally and in India, it came through Mumbai around 1930s. You should remember that Mumbai is believed to have the second most Art Deco buildings in the world. The first city to have the most Art Deco buildings is Miami. So you should understand that in Bombay also initially there was Gothic style of architecture only. But in the early years of 20th century, Gothic architecture came to an end. This is because it is said that many transformations took place in Bombay from the year 1919. That is when the First World War came to an end. During this time, an exhibition was held in Paris and this exhibition became the factor for a new movement in architecture and decorative arts. And this is where the Art Deco was born. And it immediately became prominent because the post-war society very quickly liked this style. Why they liked this? Because this style was a representation of all that was modern, luxurious and beautiful. They even saw it as a symbol of strong economy and it inspired people to hope for a prosperous future. But remember, architectural critics hated the idea of Art Deco because they saw this style as more commercial rather than being modern. See, I talked about the Art Nouveau style, right? It is one of the modern take on architecture. It was when modernism was inculcated in the architectures. And after that, only Art Deco came. So, what are the features that makes uh, Art Deco special? See, Art Deco buildings have sleek, linear appearance. They have stylized ornamentations. Most often, they are geometric uh, patterns such as uh, chevrons, pyramids, stylized uh, sunbursts or florals, zigzags and even other geometric shapes. They also have decorative geometric windows and doors. And in this architecture, low relief decorative panels can be found at entrances around windows and along the roof edges. Now, what kinds of materials are used for the construction? See, it used distinctive smooth finish building materials. It included uh, stucco, concrete block, glazed brick, mosaic tiles, etc. So, this style of architecture uses both modern and traditional building materials. Actually, this Art Deco style is one of the most easiest to find and identify because it has uh, sharp edged looks and it also has stylized geometrical decorative details. So, Art Nouveau and Art Deco both were an attempt to embody the ideas of modern age in the architecture. And the significance for India is Art Deco architecture was chosen by builders as a protest against the Britishers because they were following the Art Nouveau style. So, I hope you understand why I chose this topic today. 
with these factual details about certain architectural styles during the colonial period now let us move on to the next session which is the practice questions discussion session now before taking up the practice questions for today just look at these uh, news articles as you can see it talks about a uh, issue regarding the excise policy of delhi government and in this issue now the cbi has issued lookout circulars against eight private persons see here ignore the news the point that you should focus is lookout notice or lookout circulars see often this terminology is now in news so it is better to know about it actually we have already covered this topic in detail on our may 23rd hindi news analysis on that day we saw what are the conditions and procedures followed and what are the arguments against such lookout circulars you can just go through that analysis i'll give the link for that analysis in the description box and also in the comment section okay now let us take up the first practice question for today this question is regarding the legal aid defense council system it is a two statement question first statement is legal aid defense council office exclusively deals with legal aided cases both in criminal and civil matters see this statement is incorrect because during discussion itself we saw that this is exclusively for criminal cases only and also it will be taken up in the sessions court at the first instance and that on a pilot basis and it will not be dealing with civil matters so first statement is incorrect now the second statement the defense council appointed under the office of legal aid defense council system cannot be terminated without prior notice so this is also incorrect because services of any staff including the legal aid defense council who is engaged in the office of legal aid defense council system can be terminated at any time and that too without any prior notice and this can happen in certain cases only it can be done when that officer breaches any duty or service required in the office or when they accept any gains from the legal aid seekers or when they get convicted for any offenses or when they indulge in political activities so like this in these 10 instances they can be terminated without any prior notice okay so this statement is also incorrect but before marking the correct answer look at the question it asks you to choose the incorrect statements so be careful before marking the correct answer here the correct answer is option c both 1 and 2 let us take up this question it is a question that appeared in prelims 2013 let me read out the question under the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers recognition of forest rights act of 2006 who shall be the authority to indicate the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights or both the authorities given are state forest department district collector or deputy commissioner then tahsildar or block development officer or mandal revenue officer and the last option is gram sabha and here the correct answer is option d gram sabha only see under the forest rights act gram sabha has many roles this gram sabha is the one that initiates the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights which may be given to the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers in addition to this it also recommends developmental projects which are managed by the government which involve felling of trees and diverting of forest lands it also considers the resettlement packages given to the forest dwellers and gram sabha is the one that is uh, interested to take steps to conserve forest and protect wildlife so the correct answer is option d today i only have two prelims practice question the quiz question for you will be posted as a poll along with this video try to answer that question also and the answer to this poll question will be posted tomorrow after 24 hours in the comment section of this video and the poll question okay now let me take the mains question for today what are the challenges and opportunities offered by frt in the country also discuss the measures to overcome the challenges very simple and direct question many points you can get from the analysis itself but don't limit your answers to the points mentioned in the analysis try to think about more okay you can write the answer and post it in the comment section and i will review it okay so this brings us to the end of the hindi news analysis for the date 22nd of august 2022 if you like this video don't forget to like comment and share and also subscribe to our channel for receiving regular updates regarding civil services preparation thank you